You want something unique on keto, but you don't want one of these Franken foods that's coming out that has all kinds of ingredients that you can't pronounce. That's just as bad as it was before you went keto, right? Well, let's take a look at a few very unique keto friendly foods that aren't talked about that also have some nutritional value. We'll break them all down. It's really interesting. Let's jump in. First one is one of my personal favorites. When I was a kid, I used to eat these straight up by the spoonful, capers. That's probably why I ended up so weird. But the reality is capers are perfect on keto. Okay, not even a question on the carb content. We don't even have to go there. But they're also packed with quercetin. So you're going to have a very powerful compound that's been demonstrated in multiple studies to be very effective when it comes down to inflammation modulation. The journal the American College of Nutrition had published a paper that was interesting. It took a look at patients with rheumatoid arthritis and it gave them 500 milligrams of quercetin per day for eight weeks. Okay, one it found at the end of the study, their tumor necrosis factor alpha levels were significantly lower. That's an inflammatory cytokine. Okay, so those were markedly lower, plus their instances of stiffness and joint pain in general went down. Okay, that's pretty darn awesome, but let's just get down to the nitty gritty. Capers taste good. They add like a nice lemony flavor to whatever you're doing. So you add them to sour cream, add them to tahini, whatever. They're just something that you can have on keto that you don't typically think of that's packs a pretty powerful nutritious punch. Which brings me into thy next one anyway, which kind of falls in that same Mediterranean category, tahini. Like, why are we not having more tahini? And honestly, even small amounts of hummus is totally okay. I mean, the small amount of carbs that you're getting from a little bit of hummus is really gonna be negligible, especially when you factor in the soluble fiber that you're getting out of the chickpeas and you're getting out of that anyway. But let's focus on tahini. Okay, there was a study that was published in the Archives of Iranian Medicine that was pretty interesting. Okay, actually what it did is it took two groups. It took a group of subjects that ate a regular breakfast and another group that replaced a component of their breakfast with two tablespoons of tahini. So equal calories between both groups. Okay, then at the end of the study, they found it was six weeks, they found that the group that had the tahini had lower levels of triglycerides. Well, this is pretty interesting because when you look at what makes up tahini, it's pretty much just sesame and EVOO. Now, sesame technically is an omega-6 fat, which may upset some people, but it's such a unique kind of fat in sesame that it's totally good to go on keto. It doesn't count as like a traditional omega-6 because it has its natural antioxidant protectant, which is gonna make it so that it does not go through that lipid peroxidation, meaning it's not a fat that's gonna go rancid and cause a ruckus inside your body. So tahini with breakfast, tahini on like a little bit of almond flour bread or something like that tastes delicious. So by all means, rock and roll with that. The next one is gonna be nori seaweed. Okay, now kombu or wakami seaweed is going to be a little bit too high in carbohydrate, but the reality is with those two kinds of seaweed, you would probably not be eating like 100 grams of it because that stuff is powerful, powerful tasting and you'd be pretty interesting if you were to just chow down on a bowl of that. But when it comes down to nori, nori is super universal. So not only are we getting the iodine that we get out of nori, which is tremendous for the thyroid, we're also getting a little bit of beta-glucans, which are a specific kind of fiber. That's why it gets kind of slimy, which is really, really good for gut diversity. But it's super universal and it's very high in B12. So if you're just doing keto and you're just trying to get I don't know, a food transport system. It's a great vehicle to get additional foods in, like roll up some chicken in it or roll up a little bit of cauliflower rice. It's just something we don't typically think of because we think sushi is out of the equation, but you absolutely can make some forms of keto sushi with other kinds of food. Uh, by the way, I put a link down below for Thrive Market. Some of the foods that I'm talking about, things like tahini, things like nori, you can get through Thrive Market. So if you wanna get those kinds of foods, there is a link down below. When you go to Thrive Market, it's an online membership-based grocery store so you can sort by diet. So you'd want to check the box for keto and then it's going to bring up all the keto items and then from there you can further filter down like baked goods or cereals or snacks or beverages or anything like that and you can find things that are going to fit within your keto profile. But I also put a link down to my favorites list which are just a few of my keto favorites from Thrive Market. Now Thrive Market is a supporter of this channel. They do sponsor content on this channel and I thank them for that but I also ask that you check them out just because it's a way of supporting this channel but also a way for you to get groceries delivered that's a heck of a lot easier. And if you use that link, you'll save 25% off your membership and get a free gift. So check them out after this video. Trust me, it is awesome. Next one is okra. Okay, if you have an air fryer, fun fact, put okra in the air fryer. Little bit of avocado oil, little bit of seasoning, and you're done. That's all you need and it's perfect. But anyway, okra is very powerful. In fact, there was a study that was published in the journal Phytotherapy Research that found that adding okra into the diet actually decreased blood cholesterol levels that were associated with a high fat, high sugar diet. 
Now, I know on keto you're not eating a lot of sugar, but it's a very viable consideration to be like a little bit concerned with your cholesterol levels when all of a sudden you're eating a bunch of fats. I mean, you can say what you want about it, but the reality is that that's a concern. So if you're eating foods like okra that have the soluble fiber content that could help lower that, then that's totally a good thing. But researchers also found in that same study that it seemed to lower plasma glucose levels, which is tremendous. The mechanism is a little bit unknown, but it seems to be that it has to do with the absorption. So it seems to slow the absorption of glucose out of the intestinal tract, which is great if you're doing keto, because then you have less potential for spiking and kicking you out of keto. So, I mean, it's a win-win all the way around. This next one, I have to give a thoughtful nod to good old Mike O'Hearn, who's always talking about duck eggs. Got me so curious a couple years ago that I ate a few of them, thought they were delicious, but I have a hard time getting my hands on them. So when we compare duck eggs to chicken eggs, yeah, duck eggs have a slightly different taste. They have like just better body. They have more flavor profile, but nutrient value, they're pretty close to the same as eggs in terms of macronutrients. So regular chicken eggs and duck eggs, you're still looking about the same amount of fat, the same amount of protein for a 100 gram serving. But what's different about duck eggs is they have a bunch more vitamin B12. So a 100 gram serving has 90% of your B12 versus chicken eggs having about 20 to 25%. And duck eggs have twice the vitamin D as chicken eggs, which is extremely important in the world that I live in. I'm always talking about how vitamin D can affect telomeres, how it can affect metabolism, how it can affect glucose uptake, all kinds of things. Very, very powerful there. But when it comes down to just like the choline, everything like that, it's about the same as a chicken egg. If you can get your hands on them, they're great. But generally you're gonna find them from a local source, which is probably why they're usually more nutritious because they're probably farm raised in someone's backyard where they're controlling everything versus you know traditional feedlot chickens. Anyhow, moving on. Next one is going to be mung beans or sprouted mung beans and sprouted kidney beans. Normally beans and legumes, things like that are pretty much off limits, but in specific cases like this with kidney beans and mung beans, if you sprout them, it actually makes them much more nutritious. There's still only like seven grams of carbs per 100 gram serving with mung beans or kidney beans that are sprouted. The Journal of Agricultural and Food Chemistry found that the germination of mung beans for just eight days, which is generally what you would sprout them for, ends up increasing the vitamin C content 24X, not 24%, 24x. Now we're talking an already bioavailable form of vitamin C that we are now 24xing. Okay, it's not like taking in regular vitamin C via ascorbic acid. It's taking it in in a true bioavailable form, which is going to be much more effective. Additionally, you're also looking at enhancing a lot of the flavonoids. So just germinating them and sprouting them will 7x the flavonoid content. So yeah, you're looking relatively low carb, high fiber, low phytic acid because you've sprouted them, and you're just getting something that you can munch on. Okay, now is one that I'm excited about that I have been on a kick lately since my son's school teacher is Indian and she cooks Indian food. Okay. Indian food, believe it or not, if you get rid of the rice and you limit the chickpeas and you make some alterations, but you just use the sauces and stuff like that, is perfectly keto. Like tiki masala, the sauce is absolutely keto friendly with like five grams of carbs in a serving. And plus you're getting all the benefits of like ginger, you're getting the turmeric, you're getting uh, coriander, which all have benefits. Ginger contains six shogal. Six shogal is a very powerful lipolysis stimulator. It stimulates the release of fatty acids out of the blood or out of the lipids into the bloodstream. Okay, that is super powerful on keto because we want to liberate fats so that we can turn them into ketones or so that we can actually oxidize them. So I don't know why people tend to think that Indian food is not keto. I mean, if you go to an Indian food restaurant, you're gonna probably have Indian food that is loaded with soybean oil, but if you make it at home and you just make the sauces or you buy some of the sauces that are on the shelves or you know someone that makes it, I would say lean into it because the spices like vastly override some of the small amounts of carbs you might be taking in. A lot of the fats are based with ghee, which is already perfect on keto, based with coconut, which is already perfect on keto. Like everything works really well. All you have to do is get rid of the starches, get rid of the chickpeas, and even those you could have a tiny bit of. Not to mention coriander is a spice that has a bunch of potential anti-inflammatory effects too. So really is a powerful thing. I would just highly recommend that you just play around with it. And again, when you look at Thai food too, like Thai food, Indian food, kind of coming along the same lines in terms of like curries and everything like that, just live a little, have some more ethnic food on keto. We tend to think in this like American box with keto a lot of times where we're thinking like burgers, steaks, this and that, when in reality we can expand and get much more out of it. So hopefully this gave you a few new ideas that you can have some fun with on keto. I'll see you tomorrow.